Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramis, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian and author of Critical Issues Commentary. In this series, we have been discussing Dutch Sheet's book, Intercessory Prayer. Last week, we were discussing this quote from the book, Intercession creates a meeting. Intercessors meet with God. They also meet with the powers of darkness. Last week, we discussed the first part of that quote, meeting with God. This week, we're going to talk about his claim that we meet with the powers of darkness. Now, in this chapter, which is chapter four, he has a very interesting view of what happened at the cross. Now, as we were discussing this earlier in the week, you mentioned E.W. Kenyon and that some of these teachings probably came from him. Yes, that's true. Okay. So we'll walk through what the Bible actually says happened at the cross compared to what Dutch Sheets claims. Now, as far as this relates to intercession, here's what he says. Let's progress our thinking to the breaking aspect of intercession meetings, enforcing the victory at Calvary. Now that to me right there sounds like new apostolic reformation teaching. Would that be correct? Yes, that's the warfare worldview, as I call it. Okay. And much like the word of faith, which is based on Kenyon, there, there's a interesting and wrong understanding of what happened at the cross, which leads to a wrong understanding of the Great Commission, the role of the Christian, the role of the apostles, and so on, which uh, the NAR considers ongoing. Okay. And it really makes a lot of confusion for people. Right. And we will actually talk more about that next week, too, as we get to this idea of transferred authority. All right, so here's what Dutch Sheets says in regards to what happened at the cross. So if you happen to be following along in the book, this is page 66. Here's what he says. Satan's worst nightmare came true when, with 4,000 years of pent-up fury, Jesus met him at Calvary. The earth rocked, and I do mean literally, with the force of the battle. Now, in parentheses, he has Matthew 27, 51. The very sun grew dark as the war raged. See verse 45. That's his note. At the moment of what Satan thought was his greatest triumph, he and all his forces heard the most terrifying sound they had ever heard. God's laugh of derision. And then he says, see Psalm 2, 4. Now, when I first read this, I thought that's very imaginative, but this does not seem to be what we find in Scripture. Yeah, it's very imaginative and creative, and I've seen that preach in meetings many years ago, and I've heard it on audio tapes, and it gets big applause lines. Uh, People get all excited, yeah. Look at what God did and so on, but they're missing the point. Okay. And they uh the point is isn't that Jesus is wrestling with Satan, but it's a the point is he's paying the price for sins once for all. All right. So at the cross, Jesus pays the penalty for our sins, but none of these verses describe what he just described here. So maybe let's take a look at a few of those that that he references. So looking back, he says, the earth rocked, and I do mean literally with the force of the battle, Matthew 27, 51. Do you want to read Matthew 27, 51 for us? Matthew 27, 51. Well, let me start with verse 50. And Jesus cried out again, with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And 
the earth shook and the rocks were split. Uh, that's what it says right there. The earth shook and the rocks were split. He didn't mention the veil being torn. Right. And this passage doesn't say anything about this being the force of the battle between Satan and Jesus. It's about forgiveness of sins. And why is it the, such that the veil is rent from top to bottom? Right. For listeners who may not know, what is the significance of that? Well, it's, it's if anyone other than a high priest having done everything appropriately would barge into the holiest place, they'd be dead. Right. The, the real problem isn't Satan. It's God's wrath against sin because of rebellion and sin and alienation from God. So Christ paid the penalty for sins once for all. So the whole thing that's between the sinner and God and God's wrath against sin is the issue, not how okay. much Satan had, and Jesus fought it out. So then he goes on to, the very sun grew dark as the war raged. See verse 45. So if you want to read verse 45, let's see if this says anything about the battle. 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell on the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama tabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a citation of scripture. And some of those who were standing there when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. And then others mocked and said, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So this is Jesus dying for sins. And the why have you forsaken me means that he is identifying with the lament in the Old Testament of people who have gone through sorrows and trials. Okay. As a matter of fact, he, rather than creating some ontological or Christological heresy by saying more than what the Bible says and looking at the context and understanding this, what we're seeing is that Jesus made it possible, the sinless one, the virgin-born son of God who lived a sinless life, died for sins once for all. And so he bore what we could never bear because we would be damned forever. Yes. We're sinners. We can't go into the holy place. Okay. And healing up his spirit means, if you look at the Luke version, where he says to the thief on the cross who did repent, today you'll be with me in paradise. Right. Then Matthew tells us the veil's torn from the top to the bottom. Only God could do that. Yes. So now we have access to God and provided by Christ. Now, in the warfare worldview, this was a wrestling match between Jesus and Satan. Right. And that's what really comes through in these pages of Dutch Sheets book. It, it was this big wrestling match with Jesus as the eventual victor. Yeah, and he calls this uh, Satan's worst nightmare came true. Yeah. Well, there is a passage that says, had they known this, they would not have, the rulers of this age would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Okay. Not clear where it's talking about the rulers, meaning the Jewish authorities and the Roman ones, or the spiritual one, it's probably both. Right. So I've referenced that. That's in Corinthians. But here he's very imaginative. And uh, here it says, at the moment of what Satan thought was his greatest triumph, he and all of his forces heard the most terrifying sound they had ever heard, God's laugh of derision. Again, very imaginative, but it's not what Matthew is telling us. Right. Now, and I, I'm God, not even sure that's what, what the psalmist was trying to tell us there. Yes. Uh, the debt is paid in full. That's true. 
But what is the yes. debt and to whom was it paid? Well, and that's a really important distinction. We talked a, a, little, about, a little bit about that last year in a, in a couple of episodes, but that's worth revisiting. To whom was the debt paid? It was paid to God as a full payment for sins once for all. Right. That's why the curtain is mentioned. Okay. The way into the holiest place. Yes. Which would not be accessible. Okay. So the problem is sin, the wrath of God against sin, and the lost sinners who need a savior. Right. God provides the lamb. Okay. Now, looking further down here, look, going down to page 67, that sheet says this. And yes, behind the scenes, it was violent. Captives were rescued. And he cites several passages that we can come back to. Bruises were inflicted. Again, several passages. Keys were exchanged and authority was transferred. Now, we don't have time to look at all of these passages, but my question is, is there somewhere in Scripture where it says behind the scenes it was violent? Do we even no. know what happened behind no, the that's scenes? Not, that's very popular. Again, I've heard Word of Faith teachers fill in all kinds of details. Okay. Yeah. The New Apostolic Reformation has a slightly different version of this same idea. This is imaginative, and it makes a nice story, but there's not much of an effort to understand what Matthew is telling us. Okay. So the uh, Holy Spirit-inspired author of the Scripture determines the meaning, not the reader. Right. So Dutch Sheets isn't the author of Scripture. He's a reader. So am I. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm saying he's not taking this in proper context. Okay. And his use of some words from the Greek or Hebrew, again, are filled in with imagination rather than careful scholarly study to see what the author means by using that particular word. Right. So here it says captives were rescued, bruises were inflicted and keys were exchanged, authority was transferred. That's an awful lot of theological concepts, bracketed scriptures, some of which are scriptures that have been difficult and they've been discussed by scholars throughout church history. And so yes. the more obscure, the better these false teachers like it. Right. Okay. Well, so one good example of that is this, and he cites this, or brackets it at least, 1 Peter 3.19, captives yeah. were rescued. I noticed well, that. Well, that's a tricky passage. Right. I noticed that too. So mm -hmm. that's where they get the idea that Jesus descended and held that in one of the creeds from church history. And so the really heretical version of this, which I can't say from this that Jesus believes it. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. But E.W. Okay. Kenyon claims that Jesus lost his divinity and becomes a mere man. Okay. I've got on tape from 1982, Kenneth Copeland making that same claim. And that as a mere man, he has to fight with Satan. Wow. And minus his divinity, now we're going to see how this battle turns out. Okay. Kind of goes back to the, the typical evangelical view of everything has to be fair. Uh, right. And even the idea of being able to do miracles, more miracles than Jesus. If Jesus did miracles through his divinity, then it's not fair. Right. The issue isn't fair. The issue is justice, and the justice is the soul that sins must die. Justice is the wrath of God is real, revealed from heaven, Romans 1, gets all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Justice is that we were lost, and God's wrath abides on us. Yes. 
the solution is the sinless one, God the Son, the virgin-born one, who Jesus Christ, who is the very creator, okay, John 1, okay. 18. He, the sinless Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, bore God's wrath. It's okay. about bearing the wrath of God against sin. Going back to Genesis, God will provide the lamb. Right. Okay. That is a beautiful picture of that. Right. And so there's so many things that could be said, but what he's saying is taking things out of context, difficult passages that I believe we certainly have taught about and dealt with, mm -hmm. and reading his own view into it. Yes. Leaving his readers, not me, because I've spent decades debunking these things by doing actual exegesis of the passages. But many people are deceived, thinking, oh, he knows something. Yeah. Satan and Jesus are battling in hell. Right. And that's the significance of the earthquake. So few people are trained to read the Bible in context so they understand the author's meaning. Yes. So they can tell us that Jesus, with the earth was shaking because Jesus is fighting with Satan. Right. It so is finished doesn't mean now we're going to have the ability to wrestle the demons and win. Okay. The way so, out is through forgiveness of sins. That's right. I wonder why, uh, now you read this and I read it. Does he mention anything about the veil of the temple being torn from top to bottom? Nope. So just to kind of recap, he says the earth rocked with the force of the battle, which he says was Matthew 27, 51. We showed that the earth shook and the veil was torn into. It says nothing about the battle. And he conveniently leaves out the very significant part where the veil is torn into. Then mm. he says the sun grew dark as the war raged. Well, all we know was that the sun grew dark. It doesn't say any war raged. And then he talks about this moment of at the moment of what Satan thought was his greatest triumph, he and all his forces heard the most terrifying sound they'd ever heard, God's laugh of derision. Matthew doesn't say that. Okay. So we've got this whole thing built on imagination and zero attempt to try and determine what Matthew was actually telling us. There's no attempt whatsoever to do exegesis, which is... How the author determines the meaning, not the reader. Yes. Whatever else these apostles and prophets of the New Apostolic Reformation, like Dutch Sheets, uh, claim, they did not write Matthew. Right. Matthew wrote Matthew, and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. If we are reading Matthew to understand the author's meaning, then that is the meaning we need to believe. Yes. Now, there's nothing about hermeneutics, which is interpreting the scripture, that tells us the more um, vivid our, our imagination is, the better we're going to be at this. Yeah. You don't have to be the equivalent of a science fiction writer to interpret Bible. The author's <laughs> meaning doesn't change. Right. There are many implications and applications, but the meaning doesn't change. Okay. The author determines the meaning. Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The reader doesn't need to get some revelation. Now, Sheets is pulling out a Greek word or a Hebrew word or a bracket of scripture from here, there, and everywhere without doing enough proof to convince me that he knows what he's talking about. Right. What does 1 Peter 3.19 have to do with any of this? He is assuming that proves his view. Right. Now, I'll just read that. Um, we have a few minutes left here. Sure. So 1 Peter 
It says this, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Now, Dutch Sheet's claim was that captives were rescued. Can we find that in that verse? I don't believe so. It's been taught that way, but read verse 18. Do you happen, do you have that in front of you? Uh, I will get it there quickly. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he may bring us to God. Okay. The first part of verse 18. Then it says, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Verse 19 goes on, which has always been considered something that we're not totally sure about, but we preached on this, and the fact is that it doesn't say Jesus went to hell. But look at verse 18. That, let me get my Bible in front of the camera here. Okay. It says this, as I read, he died for sins once for all the just for the unjust to bring us to God. That would fit nicely with Matthew 28 about the okay. rent. Yes. We have access. We don't die. Okay. We're rescued from God's wrath. Right. So the problem isn't Satan and demons. That's a corollary in the sense that uh, once Eve and then Adam rebelled and listened to the serpent, she listened to the serpent, he was convinced, and they're kicked out of paradise. Yeah. But that's not the point. The point is he died for sins once for all to bring us to God not to bring Jesus to hell to fight with Satan. Right. And in nowhere in the, in the first Peter three passage there, does it say anything about some violent scene with Satan? It no, just says he went to preach to the spirits. There is shook. You could look that up also in the old Testament. That would often uh, be associated with a theophany. Right. Okay. Which it would be a man of God's power and glory at work the earth shook okay it's not telling us that jesus is going to wrestle with satan now what do you get let's summarize this what do you get if you believe that version rather than studying matthew for what matthew says first peter for what first peter says and looking at the context and studying you end up with a whole warfare worldview that's not biblical Right. The real problem is God's wrath against sin. The solution is that Jesus Christ died for sins, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. That's yeah. very significant. This okay. other stuff is all fill. Right. Might might make for a make for a good novel should he choose to write one, but it's not true. Well, if you realize that it was let's say a play I, I, it's trying to tell us something that's not true right okay um now if somebody's going to write a, a play make a play and do certain things they have what you might call artistic license but we don't have that with the meaning of scripture exactly we okay. can't do that yeah so uh dickens for example make some interesting I was I'm sitting here looking at an old uh, record 33 and a third it's right in front of me the gospel according to Scrooge that was done in the Twin Cities here okay uh, taking the Christmas story and doing these things well that's you can say well I have artistic license that's kind of interesting that's not how you interpret scripture right okay Mm -hmm. We need to know what Matthew said. And right now, Pastor Eric has been preaching through Matthew. I've been teaching Luke Acts for years. Yes. And there's nothing more powerful. Dear listeners, what is more powerful? What God said through the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, inspired the biblical writers the holy spirit comes to us through the word okay so what's more powerful understanding what god said believing it 
and making valid application or having a wild imagination. Right. Okay. We need to know the word of God. And what is more helpful, that Jesus Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God, or, well, maybe this means, on all he claims it does, the earth was shaking because Jesus went into hell to fight with Satan. Right. You know, I, there's nothing good to be gained from imagination. No. No, there's liberty in some cases, in many cases. If you want to have stained glass windows and have that part of your church, if it's not distracting from anything, that's within artistic liber liberty. Okay. But it's not going to save anybody. Right. And, and if you well, really actually read the history of a lot of that, I don't want to get us too far off I know, track, but, I know. but a lot of that has roots back in the Catholic Church doing services oh. in Latin, which the common people didn't understand. Right. And so then it was left for the stained glass windows and the artwork to tell yeah. the story because the priests sure weren't going to. Well, the other thing it does is distract. I've been in many, even uh, various kinds of churches where you can hardly listen to the sermon because all of this stuff is going on with the architecture. Right. And the last thing that's important is what the scripture means. Yes. So those who are listening to this, and I, I can say this with the authority of God's word, the Holy Spirit inspired the scripture. The meaning of the Holy Spirit inspired author is what God has said. Okay. And Peter, 1 Peter 3, what he said verse 18, is that Jesus Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. That okay. we know. Yes. And that fits with what it says right here, uh, that Jesus paid the price for sins, the, the veil was rent in two, and we have access to God. And intercession, as we've talked also, is access to the throne of grace. The, the false teachers, and I'm not going out of bounds by calling Dutch Sheets a false teacher. He's a okay. serious false teacher. Yes. If he wants to debate this section of scripture, then do some exegesis in context and don't tell us a bunch of stories that sound interesting. Okay. All right. We are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. You can access this episode and many others, as well as years' worth of articles, at the website cicministry.org. While you're there, click on Contact and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. We want to encourage you all to stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Jessica Kramis. And Bob DeWay. We'll see you next week.